Lord, we thank you so much for this day and for the opportunity to lift our voice in praise to you. We thank you so much for the privilege of having Pastor Sandy come out. And Lord, we ask your blessing upon he and his message, upon us and our hearts, upon the power of your Holy Spirit to do miracles in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, it is a wonderful blessing beyond measure to be able to have Sandy Adams from Stone Mountain, Georgia. Many years ago, uh, Sandy attended the very first Calvary Chapel Bible College, which at that time lasted three months. He went back to Atlanta, Georgia. He's from uh, the Atlanta area. So for all you Southerners, he speaks your language, all right, tonight. But he, he went home. After Bible college, asked a, a young lady to marry him, got married a few months later, started church a few months later at the ripe old age of 22 years old. And Sandy Adams has been pastoring the very same church for the last 38 years. It is a, a beacon in the south of God's word. Let's welcome Sandy. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. And the real miracle of all of that, am I on? Okay. Here we, am I? Good. Is that, am I on? Okay, great, good. These sound guys, they've got a lot of power. It usually goes to their head. <laughs> but the real miracle in all of that is that gal I married, she still comes to our church. <laughs> Which is nothing to sneeze about after 38 years, yeah. Well, hey, it's my joy to be here. What a great, uh, what a great hamburger. <laughs> that was a good hamburger. They're supposed to have another one for me after I preach. I'll preach for hamburgers, <laughs> that's for sure. But it's great. It's really great to be here. I'm so fired up after all that worship. Tonight, we're going we're gonna to study 42 chapters. <laughs> You're laughing. I'm not laughing. I'm, I'm, we're going to study 42 chapters, but we're going to read one verse. If you'll turn in your Bibles tonight to the book of Job. To the book of Job, chapter 31. Though it's found in the middle of the Old Testament, most Bible commentators believe Job was the first book written, which really doesn't surprise me, for the lessons that God taught Job are foundational. In fact, I believe until you embrace the message of Job, the rest of the Bible won't really make sense to you. So this evening, I want us to look at God's dealings with his man Job. We're going to read one verse chapter 31, verse 35. But before we do, would you join me? Let's pray and ask for God's blessing on our Bible study. Father, thank you for this church. Thank you for its wonderful testimony in this community. Lord, the platform that you've given this church, you have taken the candle and you have put it up on the candlestick and it is shining brightly to this surrounding community. I thank you for Pastor Gerald and his wife, their family, Lord, I pray your richest blessing upon them. Lord, continue to use them, Lord, in the days ahead. And Father, I pray for us tonight that you would give us ears to hear. Oh, Lord, we are so tired of hearing the rhetoric from this world. Lord, how we need to hear from you. And so, Lord, tonight we open our hearts, we open our ears. We're here tonight, Lord, just to hear what you might say to us. Please speak to us, Lord, by your Spirit through your word, in Jesus' name, amen. In Job chapter 31, verse 35, Job cries out, Oh, that I had one to hear me. Here is my mark. Oh, that the Almighty would answer me that my prosecutor had written a book. At a kid's summer camp, a counselor was leading a discussion on creation. He explained why God created the clouds and the trees and the rocks and the rivers and the animals, that God had a good reason for all that he had created. 
That's when one little boy asked, if God has a good purpose for everything, then why did he create poison ivy? Well, his question was followed by dead silence. The counselor didn't really know how to answer. Finally, another child came to his rescue. He explained to the class, the reason God created poison ivy is because he wants us to know there's a few things we just need to keep our cotton-picking hands off of. <laughs> a good explanation indeed. I believe that when we get to heaven, we're going to discover that every story begun in this life does finish with a happy ending. There is a good reason for everything God does. The problem, though, is that we don't always see his purpose. There are issues in life, like poison ivy, that cause great grief, and for no apparent reason. Some situations appear to have no sane, logical explanation, and we wonder why. How do you respond when bad things happen and God gives no reason why? As Christians, we believe that God is sovereign. He does whatever he likes, whenever he likes, however he likes, to whomever he likes. He rules the universe, both good and evil. God is the boss. Read the first chapter of the book of Job, and you'll discover that Satan can't harm a single hair on Job's head without at least getting God's permission first. Nothing happens in our lives, or in the universe for that matter, that isn't at the very least permitted by God. Of course, God's sovereignty is a wonderful doctrine when circumstances are pleasant, when our life is going well. Oh, we're delighted that God has chosen to bless us. But what's your attitude when life takes a turn for the worse and for no apparent reason? In my early years as a Christian, I had a friend who was a captivating Bible teacher. Dan had a growing ministry. He was a husband and a father of five kids. His teaching and his ministry were influencing thousands of lives for Jesus, including mine. I'll never forget the day I heard on the radio that the prop plane he had been flying had slammed into the side of a mountain. The news broke my heart. And I can remember crying out, God, why? Look at all he's doing for your kingdom. Why this? This is also how I respond today when I hear of a hurricane that devastates a coastline or a tornado that touches down and wipes out a trailer park or a family on vacation killed by a drunk driver or a virtuous woman who's been raped, or a school shooter who targets innocent kids, or a hard-working husband who gets laid off and can no longer feed his family, or a child born with a severe handicap, or a follower of Jesus diagnosed with a cancer. What happens to your faith when you encounter these kinds of terrible situations? How do you respond when bad stuff happens to good people, even God's people, and you see nothing good result? Have you ever asked why? Oh my. Have you ever screamed why? Well, how do you deal with the poison ivy in your life? Understand, Job dealt with plenty of poison ivy. In the first two chapters of the book of Job, we learn how that overnight he lost everything. His fortune was stolen. His family was wiped out. His fitness was taken away. Even his friends forsook him. And usually a man in such distress can lean on the comfort of a devoted wife. But not Job. You remember what Mrs. Job told him? Why don't you just curse God and die? It's not exactly what you want to hear from the missus after a hard day at the office. I'm sure you've heard of the stress factor index. It's a set of numerical values that try to quantify the amount of stress produced by certain life events. For example, the death of a spouse equals a 100. The death of a close family member, a 63. Fired from a job, a 47. A pregnancy is a 40 for the wife. It's like 140 for the husband. <laughs> and on it goes. 
But the experts say that 79% of those whose stress factor index hits 300 plus, they suffer a major illness as a consequence. Well, when I calculated Job's stress factor index, it added up to 650, twice the danger level. If you think you got problems, just check out our man Job. And here's the kicker. Job did nothing to deserve what had happened to him. In fact, Job gets vindicated from the outset. Chapter 1, verse 1 tells us that Job was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. In chapter 2, verse 3, the Lord himself says that all that happened to Job came upon him, and I quote, without a cause. Yes, Job was human, and like all humans, he was a sinner, but he had done nothing specific to warrant this calamity. In fact, if you doubt Job's devotion to God, just look at his initial reaction to his loss in chapter 1, verse 21. There he utters these words, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. To me, that is one of the strongest statements of faith in all the scripture. Job 1, verse 22, sums up Job's part in his many afflictions. In all this, Job did not sin. In Job chapters 1 and 2, we are told why all this devastation occurred in Job's life. You see, Job got caught in the middle of a cosmic showdown between God and Satan. One day, the devil appeared before God in the heavenly host. And like a proud papa, God mentioned the piety of his servant Job. Satan just scoffed. Well, God, you've blessed Job so abundantly. Why wouldn't he serve you? You've spoiled him. Just allow a little hardship loose in his life, and he'll turn on you in a heartbeat. Ironically, rather than being punished for some evil deed, Job's agony was caused by just the opposite. God was so proud of Job's devotion that he staked his own honor on Job's reactions. Without knowing it, Job was serving as the appointed protector of God's glory. Whenever I read the book of Job, I'm struck by an often overlooked fact. Realize, Job never read the first two chapters of the book of Job. <laughs> he never did. We are told why he suffered, but not Job. Until the day he died, Job never got an explanation for his calamity. God never told Job why. But that sure didn't stop his friends from trying to answer the question. And for the bulk of the book, chapters 3 through 31, three pals, if you want to call them that, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar take their turns offering their explanations for the cause of Job's sufferings. I figure they were golfing buddies. They had a foursome that had a standing tea time every Saturday morning. And when Job didn't show up one week, they came to check on their friend. Well, when they arrive, they find Job. He's sitting in the middle of the ash heap. He's scratching his oozing sores with a broken shard of pottery. And for seven days, they just sit there in silence, mourning for their friend. As it turns out, just sitting there with Job, being there for Job, was really the only benefit they offered. For when they opened their mouths... They begin to torture Job with erroneous counsel. In chapter 16, verse 2, he tells them how much help they were. He says, miserable comforters are you all. You see, Job's golfing buddies are like many folks today. They were trapped in a restrictive, defective theology. I like to call it a kindergarten theology. It's the simplistic belief. It's the view that in this life, Sin is always punished, and good is always rewarded. Thus, when bad things happen, it means that the victim must have committed some sin. Well, as kids, our experiences with mommy and daddy seem to confirm this belief. <laughs> Parents see to it that our good deeds are prized and that our disobedience is punished. Oh, but then we move out into the real world. We discover that's not always how life pans out. 
Bad things do happen to good people. Bad people often get away with their crimes. Circumstances are not always just. Life isn't always fair. You know, being a bit of a golfer myself, I've noticed how that golfing buddies particularly like to hold to this simplistic kindergarten theology. When a golfer hits an errant shot off into the woods and it caroms off a tree trunk, bounces back into the middle of the fairway, he'll usually laugh and he'll say to his partner, well, looks like I'm living right. As if holy living entitles you to favorable breaks while unholy living leaves you in the rough. I wish life were that straightforward, but it's not. And this is what Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar refuse to admit. They become adamant. For 29 chapters, they scrutinize Job to uncover the slightest chink in his armor on which they can blame his demise. At points in the dialogue, they even make up accusations. Job's three friends try every tactic imaginable to pin a sin on Job. Tragically, there are Christians today who hold to this same faulty theology. Listen to most TV preachers, and you'll hear them teach a kindergarten theology. Oh, do the right thing, and you'll be rich. You'll be healthy and happy in no time. You'll be driving that Lexus before you know it. Trust me, TBN would have never invited Job to host a show. I have a friend who suffers from chronic asthma. She is a godly lady. She is a woman of prayer. I know her personally. Yet her Christian friends insisted that her suffering had to be the result of some sin in her life. Her friends, like Job's friends, went to great efforts to pin a sin on her. Reminds me of a Peanuts cartoon strip. Hope you like Peanuts. Snoopy's standing there next to his doghouse. It's been burned to the ground by a fire. He's sobbing. I've lost my pool, my Van Gogh, all of my keepsakes. That's when Lucy approaches him. And you know Lucy. She snaps at him. She says, I can tell you why your house burned down. You sinned. And Snoopy responds with one of the best theological answers ever uttered. In fact, Snoopy sounds a lot like Job. He answers, See, here's the problem with this kind of defective theology. It backs you into a corner so that when bad stuff happens in your life, you only have two options. Either God failed or I've sinned. And that's why Job's friends insist that the problem is Job. For if it isn't, in their minds, it means that God has failed. And they're not about to entertain that possibility. In reality, though, Neither assertion was true. The real cause of Job's sufferings was hidden in the heavens. Job knows there is a reason. There has got to be another explanation. He just doesn't see it. And learning why becomes the burning issue in Job's life. Once there were two Americans, they traveled down to a little town in Mexico to open up a bungee jumping operation. Well, as they erected the tower, a curious crowd of locals all gathered around to watch. Well, finally, it came time for a test jump. One of the guys, he dove off the platform. But when he bounced back up, his partner noticed that he was a little scraped up. He gasped, oh, no, the cord must be too long. Well, he tried to grab him, and he missed him. Well, the second time the guy bounced back up to the platform, he was in worse condition. He had some bruises and some broken ribs. Again, his buddy tried to grab him, but he missed him. Well, the third time he rose to the platform, the poor fellow was so badly beaten he was nearly unconscious. This time his sidekick lunged and and grabbed him and pulled him to the platform. He asked him, he said, "Was, was the cord too long? And that's when his partner replied, no, the cord was just fine, but what's a pinata? If you didn't get it, somebody will explain it to you later. (laughs) But sometimes life gets rough. 
it'll beat you up and you don't know why. Or worse, it treats your partner, your spouse, or your coworker, or your child like a pinata. And you get no explanation. He loves you, Lord. Why did this happen to him? Lord, she's such a godly person. Why her? We've all asked these questions, haven't we? Job, too, was a good and godly person, but virtue didn't insulate him from the pain in his life. And remember, it wasn't Job's sin that made him a target for hardships. It was his goodness. Don't you be deceived. Just because a person is hurting doesn't mean they're sinning. And just because they're thriving doesn't necessarily mean that God is pleased. Hey, it does pay to be good and godly, but payday doesn't always come in this life. In the here and now, calamity can strike even the godliest among us. Difficulties can hit without explanation. Faith doesn't always get a reason. Don't let life back you into a corner. When things go wrong, we think there are only two conclusions. Either God failed or I'm a failure. And since none of us are going to blame God, it's got to be me. So we beat ourselves up. But remember the story of Job. When bad stuff happens, it doesn't mean that God has failed, nor does it mean that you're a failure. There could be a reason hidden from view. Only heaven knows the whole story, and God is expecting you and I to trust in him. And this is why our responses on earth really do matter. For in a mysterious way, unknown to you and me, God's reputation may be hanging on the way we handle that hassle or that hindrance or that hardship. God's honor in heaven, his glory, may be riding on your reaction to the twists and turns life throws your way. To me, the message of Job is the most practical in all of the Bible. It ups the ante on everything that happens in my life. My every reaction becomes strategic. Think about it. Every eye in heaven may be fixed on you to see how you handle that illness or that lie told about you or that lawsuit filed against you. Will you fold or will you be faithful? This book teaches us a vital lesson, and that's this, that the stress in my life may just be a test of my faith. Listen, Satan has accused the Almighty of stacking the deck, of buying our devotion with his blessing. He assumes God is nothing more to us than a meal ticket, and he has thrown down the gauntlet. He has challenged God, nixed their blessing, and they'll stop their devotion. Do you realize that God may have chosen you to prove otherwise? God's character may be on the line in heaven, and it's your response to difficulty that wins the day. I'm just saying, the stakes may be a lot higher than any of us realize. The one certainty is that our reactions really do matter. Well, I have no doubt that Job would have gladly suffered for God if he had just been told the effect that his faithfulness was having in heaven. The problem, though, is that Job never got a hint. Understand, Job's greatest grief was not caused by his material losses or even the boils on his body. Job's most excruciating pain was not knowing why. I found it the best pain reliever by far. It's not Advil. It's not Tylenol 3. It's not even Demerol. It's an explanation. If there's a good reason behind our suffering, we tend to rise to the occasion. But how do you respond when God refuses to give you a reason? It's like going to the doctor to get a shot. I hate shots. But if I'm told the reason for the shot, I can accept it and endure it and maybe even be thankful for it. But what if I'm given a series of shots without being told their reason? Trust me, I won't be as tolerant. In fact, I'm going to get downright ugly and upset. I'm going to start pounding my fist down on the counter, and I'm going to demand to know why. And this is exactly what Job begins to do in this book. He begins to pound his fist. And over the course of the dialogue with his three friends, Job demands more and more and more to know why. 
In fact, in chapter 7, verse 11, Job even grows bitter. He moans these words. I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. It's interesting. The word complain occurs more times in Job than any other book of the Bible. More over half of the complaints recorded in Scripture fall from the lips of this one man, Job. We often speak of the patience of Job, but the person in this story with the real patience was God. He is the one who had to put up with Job's spewing bitterness. See, here's what happens. Job loses perspective. And it's so easy for a sufferer to lose perspective. Job forgets who God is, his holiness, his righteousness. Job grows bold and brash. You see, as he questions God, in Job's mind, in his own estimation, Job becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, and God becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. It's been said, in asking why, Job loses his way. And by the time we get to our text, chapter 31, verse 35, which we read earlier, Job believes God owes him an answer. In fact, he demands it in writing. Oh, that the Almighty would answer me, that my prosecutor had written a book. God, I want a reason, and I want it in print. Arrogance has replaced Job's innocence. Job has become so sure of himself that he started to doubt God. And at one point in the dialogue, Job, in essence, says to his friends, if my only options are I've sinned or God has failed, then God has failed, for I certainly haven't sinned. Job, who do you think you are? Job comes perilously close to blasphemy. Have you ever been close to blasphemy? In his commentary on Job, author Don Baker makes this point about pain. Pain speaks a strange language. It plays funny tricks on us. It makes us think things and say things and even believe things that are not true. When pain bores its way through human flesh and into the human spirit and then just sits there and hurts and hurts, the mind becomes clouded and the brain begins to think strange thoughts like God is dead or he's gone fishing or he just doesn't care. You see, pain was having this kind of an effect on Job. And toward the end of Job's discourses, he starts challenging God to speak. He charges God with giving him a raw deal. He accuses God of being unfair. In his attempts to vindicate himself, Job accuses God. Job is more into proving his own innocence than he is in upholding God's justice. In short, Job cops an attitude. Always remember, there are chapters in your story that God has yet to write. Zophar can only speak so far. God had a glorious outcome for Job. In the end, he got double the blessings he had before. But until the day he died, he never learned the why behind his trials. Friends, some situations have reasons that will only make sense when we get to heaven. Today we live a temporal, earthbound existence. And that is why it is wrong for us, from our limited perspective, to question or to criticize an eternal God. We're told in Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. If he doesn't choose to tell them to you, don't you push it. Never forget one of the first rules of theology, where God has placed a period don't you change it to a question mark. If God doesn't offer an explanation, learn to live without one. Ultimatums don't work on God. We need to trust in his wisdom. See, here's the big question for you and me this evening. Can we trust God even when we can't trace him? Oh, it's easy to praise God when we see his hand at work. When his blessings, even his lessons, are tangible. But is our faith alive enough to survive even in the dark? 
Did you hear about the four passengers traveling on the train from Los Angeles up to San Francisco? All four riders, they were seated in the same compartment. There was a Los Angeles Dodgers fan. There was a San Francisco Giants fan. There was a gorgeous young woman, and there was an elderly lady. Well, everyone was being very cordial until the train passed through this long, dark tunnel. Suddenly, there was a loud kiss, followed by an equally loud slap. Well, when the train exited the tunnel, the passengers were just sitting there looking at each other, trying to sort out what the noises had meant. Well, the beautiful woman, she thought, my, that's odd. A San Francisco fan tries to kiss the elderly woman and not me. (laughs) The elderly lady, she thought, my, that young woman, she's a good girl. She has some fine morals. The San Francisco fan thought, my, that Dodgers fan, he's a smart guy. He steals a kiss and I get slapped. While the Dodgers fan is sitting there gloating, he's thinking, perfect, I kiss the back of my hand, slap a Giants fan, and nobody ever knows. (laughs) Sometimes things happen in the dark. And God chooses not to reveal his specific reasons. And if we're not careful, we can draw the wrong conclusions, can't we? We can. Reminds me of the little boy who was scared of the dark. Late one night, his mom asked him to go out on the back porch and fetch the broom. He balked. He said, but mommy, it's dark out there. The mother told him, said, honey, don't worry. Jesus is always with you. He's with you wherever you go. He's with you even when you're in the dark. The little guy, he walked to the back door, cracked it open a fraction of an inch, and then he shouted out. He said, hey, Jesus, if you're out there, how about handing me that broom? (laughs) Realize God wants us all to learn. Listen, God wants us all to learn that Jesus is with us even in the dark places. Well, how do you react when circumstances occur you don't deserve? Have you become bitter? Have you gotten angry? Have you been demanding an explanation? Have you been pounding your fist down on the counter? Is your name Job? Let me show you how God finally responds to Job. In chapter 38, you can turn there if you'd like. In chapter 38, God appears to Job, but not to answer his questions. No, God takes a most unusual tact. He comes to Job asking questions, not answering them. And for five chapters, God asks Job a series of questions he can't possibly answer. A total of 70 unanswerable questions. The Almighty is about to show his servant Job he doesn't know as much as he thinks he does. It's time for God to put Job back in his place. Well, God appears to Job in the whirlwind, and he says in verse 2, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? That's a fancy way of saying, who's this guy I've been listening to who doesn't know what he's talking about? He says, now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you will answer me. It's time for Job to eat some humble pie. God is about to remind Job that you spell the word God G-O-D, not J-O-B. In verse 4, God begins his quiz. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? (laughs) Job has been instructing God on how to run the universe. But here God makes it clear he doesn't really need Job's help. He was doing fine long before Job came along. God asked Job, tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. God even becomes sarcastic. Okay, Job, was it you holding the other end of the tape when we measured out the universe? I don't think so. 
See, throughout this book, Job's incessant questioning of God's wisdom implied that he could do a better job of running the universe than God. But could he? Can you? On and on, these questions continue. God keeps firing queries at Job. He has no way to answer. It's interesting. As Job had questioned God, in Job's estimation, he had grown larger and larger, and God had gotten smaller and smaller. But here, when the roles are reversed, and God questions Job, suddenly in Job's thinking, it's God who's becoming larger and larger again, and it's Job who's becoming smaller and smaller and tiny. Job is getting taken down a notch or two. As we say back home, he's getting whittled down to size. Up against God's infinite wisdom, a finite Job knows very little. What right does he have to question or criticize the Almighty? I mean, who does he think he is? I mean, what if I were playing golf one day with Phil Mickelson, one of the greatest golfers to ever swing a stick? What right would I have to start giving Phil pointers? Hey, Phil, let old Sandy help you with your swing. You know, I got some pointers. I've been watching you, Phil, and I think I can help you. Come here a minute. Let me give you some pointers. Who's kidding who? But Job is being just as arrogant. He is trying to coach God on how to run the universe. Who does he think he is? See, Job has gotten way out of line. Here's a great quote for you. If there's anything a sufferer needs, it's not an explanation. It's a fresh, new look at God. We think we need an explanation. What we need is a revelation of who God is. We think we need an answer that will never be satisfied until we know why. But what we really need is a clear vision of God. For when God appears, the reason for the trial no longer matters. For all that matters is God. Well, Job thinks he's learned his lesson. Listen to his reply to God in chapter 40, verse 4. He says, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, twice, but I will proceed no further. Now, at first, it may seem as if Job has gotten the message, but I don't think so. Job has simply gone from pounding to now pouting. He's gone from beating his fist to now sticking out his lip. In essence, he's saying, okay, God, you win. You've made your point. From now on, I'm just going to shut up and serve you. See, Job agrees to serve the Lord, but you can bet he's going to serve God with a grudge. And I got to ask you, do you know anybody who's been serving God with a grudge? See, Job has accepted God's sovereignty, for he has no other choice, but he doesn't really like it. Realize, God doesn't want us to pound or pout. There is a third option. We can praise God for who he is, come what may. God wants us to embrace his sovereignty with a loving, trusting wholeheartedness. See, you can say lovingly, Lord, thy will be done. Or you can say begrudgingly, all right then, God, have it your way. And here Job is doing the latter. He's giving in only because he has no other option. And God is not through correcting Job's attitude. For again, God comes to Job in a whirlwind. And in chapter 40, verse 7, he says, Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. God didn't like the first answers he got from Job. And so he has some more questions. Let's do this again. And in chapter 40, God points to two enormous, powerful animals, the behemoth and the leviathan. And he asks Job if he can even contain these animals, let alone create them. Job seems pretty puny when pitted up against these forces of nature. See, God is relentless in his humbling of Job. For he is after in Job what he wants from us. Not reluctance but repentance. God wants Job and us to rejoice in his sovereignty, to worship him despite our situation. 
God wants us to acknowledge that he not only runs the universe, but he runs our lives, and he is better at it than we are. God does all things well all of the time. Do you believe that? You know, today when a church builds a sanctuary like this one, the architect is careful to optimize all of the sight lines so that it doesn't matter where you're sitting in the room. You can see all that's going on up front. There's not a bad view in the house. But the Reformation architects of the great cathedrals in Europe, they had the opposite idea. They deliberately created worship venues where your view was blocked by a pillar or a rail or perhaps an awkward angle where you couldn't see everything going on up front. It was a reminder to the worshiper that there are some truths about God that are hidden, that no one knows all there is to know about God, that we all worship God from a limited vantage point. Well, Job finally realizes this truth in chapter 42, verse 1. This time when Job answers God, he humbly gets it right. He says, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You ask, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you, and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Obviously, Job has a change of attitude. Listen, friends, Job never did learn why, but he learned something much more valuable. He learned who. And when you know who, you don't need to know why. There are people I know whose chief ambition in getting to heaven is to get answers to their questions. Oh, and I'm certain they'll get their answers. But I'm just as certain that in heaven their answers won't be nearly as important as they thought. For when we see the beauties and the glories of our Lord Jesus, all of the perplexities and all of the questions will be overshadowed. In the end, the who will swallow up all of the whys. Following the difficult days of World War II, King George VI of England, he made a statement to his countrymen about the uncertainties of the coming new year. I said to the man at the gate of the year, Give me a light that I may walk safely into the unknown. He said to me, go out into the darkness and put your hand in the hand of God and it shall be to you better than the light and safer than the known. Imagine that. The hand of God even safer than the light and better than the known. Some of you are walking out into uncertain futures, and you've been questioning God. Don't you think a better approach is to grip his hand just a little tighter? Once there was an old man, he was walking with his grandson. When he asked the boy, he said, son, do you know where you are? No, grandpa, I don't. Son, do you know how far you are from home? No, sir. Well, son, it sounds like to me you're lost. Little boy grinned, nope, Grandpa, I can't be lost. Grandpa asked him, he said, well, why can you be so sure? The little guy replied, I can't be lost, Grandpa, because I'm with you. And that's what God wants us to learn. That even when we don't understand, even with no explanation, we are never lost when we're with God. He can be trusted. Well, how do you cope with the poison ivy in your life? Here's what Job would tell us. God is sovereign. He is a big God. He takes orders from no one. He does as he pleases without giving us an explanation or offering us permission. That's why we need to turn off our complaints and our doubts and our questions, and we need to turn on our praise. For God is worthy to be worshipped. 
Love God. Don't fight him. Trust God. Don't question him. Real faith doesn't need to know why when it's certain of who. Always remember this statement. What's over my head is still under God's feet. Would you like to try to say it with me? Ready? What's over my head is still under God's feet. That's not a good southern effort. (laughs) You want to try it again with a little gusto? You ready? What's over my head is still under God's feet. God loves you so much. In fact, he is so proud of you that he has staked his honor on your reactions. Imagine this. God believes that your response to difficulty is going to bring him glory. Father, we thank you for your word to us tonight. Lord, we thank you for this amazing book. How it sets the stage for all the books that follow. Thank you, Lord, for the story of Job for how applicable it is to some of us tonight. For I have no doubt there are some Job's here tonight who have been pounding their fist, who have been pouting, who serve you. Oh, they serve you, but they serve you with a grudge. Forgive us, Lord. Please forgive us for copping an attitude. Lord, we... We've been demanding an explanation, and what we've needed all along is a revelation. It's not so much why that we need to know, but we need to know who. For when we know you, Lord, when we can look into your heart, there we find all of the comfort and all of the peace and all of the love and all of the joy we need. So, Lord, reveal yourself to us tonight, Lord. Reveal yourself in your wonderful grace and your incredible mercies. Fill our hearts with your spirit, Lord. Help us to see you for who you are and help us to trust you, Lord. Help us to trust you with all our hearts. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you.